when Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Jesus unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The Lord has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. All spoke well of me and were awestruck at the gracious words that came from my mouth. All spoke well of us and were thrilled at the gracious words that came from our mouths. All spoke well of them and were so blown away by the gracious words that came from their mouths. I'm practicing the end of this sermon. These words feel so good in my mouth, and I want to say this line to maximum effect so that after all is said and done today, we can go out recharged for the work that God has given us. But perhaps we should back up a couple of verses. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to speak. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And who wouldn't speak well of him after that? For Jesus had just read much beloved verses from the scroll of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. And these people were glad to hear that finally these words were being fulfilled. Because really, if anyone was in need of good news, release, sight, and freedom, it was these poor Judeans in the back corner of the Roman Empire in the first century. Now, I doubt that anyone sitting there had noticed at the time that Jesus had stopped reading before the passage had really ended just as I'm not real sure that anyone has noticed that we did the same thing just now. We quit reading even before the verse was ended. Don't worry. We'll come back to that. What we're noticing right now is that all eyes were fixed on Jesus in pride, amazement, joy, relief. Fixed on Jesus. The theme of this assembly at this oh-so-strange moment in history. A pandemic assembly postponed from last spring and then pushed online, where as I speak these words, I can't even see your reactions. Preaching is hard enough, as every pastor will tell you, but in the last six to seven months, 
it has been grueling. For preaching is a communal act. And those of us who have been called, as Dr. Joey Jeter used to say, speak a good word for Jesus, we depend upon the reactions of our congregations. Believe me, when we stand up to speak gospel, we know just by looking out when we are preaching with you, when we are preaching to you, when we are preaching at you, and when we are stepping on your toes, you don't have to tell us in the joy it line at the end of the service, you know, the line that forms at the exits of our sanctuary when people pass by the pastor saying, enjoyed it, enjoyed it, pastor, so enjoyed it. No. When we stand up, we see it in your faces, in your smiles and your scowls, in your crossed arms and your wide eyes. We hear it in your amens and come on and preach it in the historically black churches. And we hear it in the pulsating, vibrating silence of historically white churches. I've got to tell you that preaching in this age, whether we're recording or live streaming or preaching to the socially distant few, it's one of the hardest things we've ever done, which may actually be why we need to do it this way now more than ever. I mean, we preachers need to do it. Because here's the truth. On our worst days, we can hardly wait until that joy at line when all spoke well of us and were amazed, amazed at the gracious words that came from our mouths. Those bad days, for on those days, our eyes are not fixed on Jesus. They just aren't. Instead, they're fixated on ourselves and on our listeners, our captive audiences, or on our idols of Jesus, but not Jesus himself. What is it Annie Lamott says? You can safely assume that you have created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates everybody that you hate. And we can add, we can safely assume that we have created Jesus in our image when it turns out that the primary people to whom Jesus has come to preach good news is us. Which, as I'm quite sure you already know, is the mistake made by those Judeans sitting in the synagogue watching Jesus read their favorite scripture. Their eyes may have been fixed on Jesus, but their souls, they were fixated on themselves. So maybe they were glad that Jesus ended his reading of Isaiah 61 with, and proclaim the year of God's favor. Because the next line in Isaiah is, and proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. Which kind of takes the shine off those lovely verses, doesn't it? Unless, of course, we're imagining the vengeance of God against all those people we hate, right? Other, otherwise, we're forced to deal with two things. Either God gets angry, which cuts against the grain of our images of God as loving, caring, and basically benign, or the reality that we may actually deserve a little of that vengeance ourselves. But I digress. As I was saying, 
their souls were fixated on themselves and on their own hopes and dreams about what Jesus was going to do for them. And I really am in perfect sympathy with them because we also need so much right now. We need an end to COVID-19. And if, if we can't have that, we need Jesus to tell everyone to wear their masks. We need some civility in our national politics, some rational discussion, some truth-telling, some responsibility-taking. And if we can't have that, we need Jesus to tell everyone with whom we disagree to shut up. We need some justice in our relationships. We need some justice for persons of color who have too long been denied basic human freedom and dignity. And if we can't have that, we need Jesus to tell us it's okay to ignore the injustice happening right in front of our very eyes. But she, Jesus is not bound up or bound by what we think we need on any given day. For while our eyes may be fixed on Jesus, his eyes are fixed on the suffering, the pain, the inequities, the exclusions of all people whether they are members of our group or not. In point of fact, the ways and means of Jesus are not our ways and means. You know from high school civics that the Ways and Means Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives oversees the federal budget, and it is tasked with finding the ways and means to raise the revenues for the budget. It's the chief tax writing committee of our nation. And as such, it is, in fact, the place in our federal government where the nit meets the grit, where priorities are truly seen for the real importance by how much money we actually allocate to them. It is the place where lofty rhetoric about caring for the elderly and the indigent and the least of these and supporting our military and caring for our veterans and ensuring equal access to all the benefits of a free society, it is the place where that lofty rhetoric meets practical and sometimes harsh realities and limitations. No matter what we may think right now of the current federal budget, we can agree that in fact it does show the true values of those writing it in the House of Representatives. Jesus, he has his own ways and means about where spirituality and physicality meet about how God's household ought to be run and its completely disruptive of the status quo. It is profoundly uncomfortable for Jesus' ways and means do not depend on structures of compromise and good order. They do not place the preservation of institutions or personal power or smooth operations at the center of everything else. To fix our eyes on Jesus is to learn his ways and means. To fix our eyes on Jesus is to notice that not only does, his fix, does he fix his eyes on us with such love, but that he fixes them on all who need good news that feeds body and soul, liberty that frees minds and lives, sight 
that opens brown eyes and green eyes, hazel eyes and blue eyes to see not just ourselves as God's beloved, but all as God's special beloved. And Jesus fixes his eyes on God's economic ways and means in a world that denies too many the basic necessities and a fair shake. And once Jesus began to explain to those friends in the synagogue, once he began to explain that he was including everyone, I mean everyone in this work, his hometown crowd's joy and amazement turned to anger and they tried to throw him off a cliff. That's the part of the telling of this story that we left out today. Well, I said earlier that we preachers on our very worst days crave the positive reactions of the people with whom we try to share the ways and means of Jesus. That's because our eyes have become fixated on, well, you. And goodness knows, seeing you before us is a privilege and a joy, and speaking gospel to you is an awesome responsibility that most of us would never trade. That's why another reason why this pandemic can be just so soul-crushing But on our best days, our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And we speak the truth of God's favor for all people, regardless of the reactions of the people in the pews, or the Zoom screens, or the chat boxes. And we depend not on the affirmations in the joy line, but on the gospel truth that Jesus preached, the love of God that he offers even to us. And then, and only then, can we say, God, God spoke well of us and was pleased at the gracious words that came from our mouths. Amen. <laughs>